welcome everyone. Uh, delighted to have Rita Saranga and Jonathan here um, to uh, talk about uh, the U.S. Uh, the arrival of the U.S. in Europe as a venture and uh, in the investing scene in a much bigger way this past year. And um, sort of for context, uh, you know, I've been in the uh, the startup business for over 20 years now, and um, you know, for most of that time, the Silicon Valley has been absolutely dominant, uh, biggest source of venture funding, biggest source of exits, um, and so all the big companies that were going to get really big would go there earlier or later. Um, with the democratization of startup capital, uh, with remote distributed teams, improved uh, global communications, and more recently also the pandemic, making investors more comfortable to invest away from their home base, clearly this is changing. And so what I wanted to explore on this conversation was um, what that means for startups in thinking about their fundraising options, uh, especially for European startups with the context of the US in terms of you know when to go to raise and think about the US. Uh, so uh, first I wanted to introduce my wonderful panelists, three great friends who are um, very active in the venture business, um, all in their different uh, geographies and funds. So uh, maybe uh, Rita's first, I'll ask you to do a quick introduction of yourself and Lightspeed Venture Partners. Sure. Thanks, Anjus. Uh, really delighted to be here. Uh, my name is Ritas. Uh, I'm a partner with uh, Lightspeed Venture Partners, um, uh, the first partner in uh, in Europe. Joined the firm in 2019 and uh, helping to spearhead our efforts um, in the old continent. Um, Lightspeed has been investing in Europe uh, since 2007, actually, uh, although for a period of time that was maybe a less systemic uh, effort uh, than uh, than it has become over the last few years. Um, as a firm, you know, we invest across stages uh, and uh, categories. Um, Lightspeed manages $4.2 billion just in the latest set of funds. So you will see us leading, you know, some seed rounds and you will see us leading some serious E, you know, multi-billion rounds as well. So we really look across categories. And so look forward to the conversation today about, you know, that and, you know, stages and investors and types and all of those other good things. So really delighted to be here. Thanks, Anitis. And uh, Saranga, maybe uh, go next with you and Balderton. Sure. Yeah. Hi, I'm Saranga. I'm a partner at Balderton Capital. We are a um, London-based pan-European venture firm. Uh, we've been around for about 20 years and in all that time we've been focused entirely on the European opportunities. So basically investing in European founders and European companies, um, but usually those with a global ambition, right? Companies that are starting in Europe, uh, but want to go and take over the world. And, and they can be anywhere in, in Europe, although the team um, historically has been based primarily around London. We, we've invested in everywhere from sort of Finland and Iceland all the way down to Italy and Spain. And you can do the same on the west and the east of the continent as well. Um, my background originally is as an entrepreneur. Uh, before that, I was a software engineer, so I come from a technical background. And we, we invest as a firm across the board from deep tech companies through enterprise software all the way to, to consumer tech. We're more focused on the stage side. So historically, we focused primarily on Series A level investing. We'll occasionally invest a bit earlier or a bit later, but most of what we've done has been Series A. Uh, but that is also about to change where we're you know, going to have some options in the near future where we will be able to invest a bit later as well. Fantastic. And uh, last but not least, uh, Jonathan, one of my classmates from the Kaufman Fellow Program, which is uh, a delight to have uh, have involved. Uh, so Jonathan, uh, yourself and, and also Tribe Capital. Sure thing. Uh, sorry, I'm like holding my phone here. So hopefully I can hold it steady. Um, <laughs> I'm one of the founding partners of Tribe Capital. We're an early stage firm uh, located in San Francisco. Uh, we're about three years into our journey at this point, um, uh, about a billion dollars under management, um, really sort of stage agnostic, sector agnostic, uh, with a particular focus really on understanding um, growth, early stage product market fit, and really being able to measure it and quantify it using a bunch of these analytical techniques we've been developing for uh, many, many years. Uh, we've done a fair bit of international investing, although not a whole ton in Europe yet. But that's not for want of um, desire. You know, uh, I think it's more that we haven't we haven't quite um, gotten there yet. Uh, but I expect we will do so at some point. We have a couple of investments in London, but uh, but that's about but that's that. But yeah, excited to be here. Fantastic, thanks, Jonathan. And so I guess the the first question uh, is sort of uh, you know provocative in nature. So is the age of dominance by Silicon Valley over 
Um, and now really this is uh, a different game where you can build big companies uh, in Europe, uh, raise money in Europe and you know maybe even forget about the USA if you're not interested. Who wants to take that? Um, I'm happy to, to start, maybe. Oh, I'm happy so to start. Um, happy to yeah, um, I mean, look, I, I think um, I, I think that like with a lot of these things, with a lot of these shifts that happen, um, the shift actually happens way earlier than you than you sort of realize. And then once it becomes obvious, it's already been happening for a long time. And so as someone who lived in Silicon Valley for 12 years, in San Francisco for 12 years, and, and, and I know and love the Bay Area um, and learned a lot from it and enjoyed my entrepreneurial experience through it. Um, Certainly when I moved out there, it was rare to see the same level of energy and ecosystem uh, in other parts of the world. And I think that's really changed over the last 20 years. We've seen that be born, not just in Europe, but actually in lots of other places of the world as well. Um, Silicon Valley still continues to be incredibly important. It's still the epicenter of a lot of what our industry does. Um, but um, but I do think that you can absolutely build a, you know, a large, um, globally significant company uh, in many, many parts of the world, including most of Europe. Um, and in fact, a whole bunch of people already have. And, and you can build pretty much any kind of company, whether that's a consumer tech company, an enterprise software company, a deep tech company, or whatever else you're interested in. So that, for me, makes it super exciting. Um, you, you will still probably have to get on planes at some point and go to the world, because ultimately, I think customers and investors and employees and the best talent will live in lots of different places. Um, and so part of that will, of course, include the US. So. I don't think that's going away, but um, the exciting news is you can, you can, I really think you can start almost anywhere these days and you can build there as well. Super. I, uh, I sort of agree and, and, and disagree with Saranga in some, in some ways, um, you know, also been investing and, and also um, operating as an entrepreneur, you know, for the past, you know, what, almost 14 years. And the shifts we'd, we'd seen in, in Europe, uh, in the venture ecosystem and the startup ecosystem are, 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 are absolutely phenomenal, not just in terms of, you know, you know, headline grabbing stuff like availability of capital, big rounds, unicorns, centicorns, um, no, sorry, decacorns, centicorns, we don't have very many yet, although I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, uh, but um, what we've also seen very much uh, is is just a shift in fundamental cultural acceptance uh, of entrepreneurship, uh, you know, in Europe, um, and that's just something that um, that drives uh, really a completely different sort of level of shift. Uh, and uh, and 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 the you know young people now you know graduating from best universities and programs are very seriously considering and starting companies you know from the get go or going to work for. Uh, for other entrepreneurs and uh, in, in, in other startups and, and really starting their careers, uh, you know, as, as entrepreneurs, as startup people, that, that just that just wasn't the case. That wasn't really even acceptable as a path, you know, for the longest time. And it started, you know, changing, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, but really gained pace only over the last sort of, you know, six, seven years, I would say. So, so it's been, you know, a massive shift and, and, and certainly a lot of positive things. And also local venture ecosystem has evolved. You know, you have now local, you know, advisors, you know, lawyers, accountants, you know, like the whole ecosystem that just wasn't really there. Like they didn't even know how to deal with, with startups just like, you know, 10 plus years ago. Um, mm -hmm. Now it's all there. So that's all great. Um, it, it does, though, um, mean that, you know, if you're striving, you know, for greatness in that environment, I think you know inevitably uh you know a lot of the history of, of venture capital um and also of companies going public of companies ultimately finding uh you know uh homes uh by way of being acquired you know a lot of that sort of points back you know to the us in many instances not always and with some very notable exceptions but as a rule that would still be you know quite true so i think you know to, to sarangas maybe in closing remark there um I don't think that that Silicon Valley is is irrelevant. Uh, in fact, it's ever as ever you know relevant, uh, or, or perhaps even more relevant um, for European entrepreneurs and founders. You know, really striving for greatness and trying to maximize the potential. There's no question that markets today are more accessible. They are more um, uh, democratically you know reachable. Uh, you know, for folks around the world, irrespective of where you are. You know, you have more access to that, but there's just no no going around it um, that there's going to be relevance uh, and significance uh, of 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 uh, of investors, you know, across the Atlantic as well. Um, 
and I think the stats are pretty, you know, pointing in that direction as well. Uh, uh, you know, most of the serious sort of B and later rounds have U.S. capital involved, and by sort of serious C later uh, and, and later, like it becomes sort of the, the norm, um, you know, to have some or much or, or, or entirely, you know, U.S. sort of base capital. But I think it's also drifting a little bit, you know, towards earlier stages, and it's getting a little bit more sort of distributed between, you know, European and U.S. And, uh, you know, lots of firm, you know, partner up these days as well, like, you know, really support companies on both sides of the coast, you know, from the beginning as well. So anyway, just uh, just a bit of, uh, of that of that sort of perspective as well. Jonathan? Jonathan? Cool, yeah. I think one of the things that, um, you know, I think both of you were sort of hinting at is sort of this, the structure of the capital market and the, and the capital market difference between um, Europe and the U.S. and how it's sort of evolved over the last 10 years. You know, when I think about sort of the, the big trend that's played out um, really over that sort of time frame is just sort of the massive influx of capital into venture capital. Now, there's kind of two places where that's happened. There's one area which is on the seed side, right? There's a ton. It's, it's much easier to start a seed firm now in the U.S. and also in Europe to some extent, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, part of this is because you can just write smaller checks. And that's because entrepreneurs can get by on less now than they could, you know, sort of 10 years ago. And so, and so, um, and so there's a lot more seed firms, which means that if you're an entrepreneur, um, that's better, right? Because then you have more people to talk to, whether American or, or European, that's good. Okay. On the flip side of it, um, there are, um, you know, with this sort of influx of capital, there's a large appetite from the capital side to be at the growth stage. So there has been, you know, an explosion of sort of growth firms, growth funds, um, in the US and um, there has been you know, some of that also um, to some extent in Europe. I'd really say that maybe the reflection there is more that the growth funds in the US, when they get very big, they're looking for any opportunity. It's like, okay, any, 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 can anybody show me a company you know, is sort of over 10, a few tens of millions of dollars of revenue um, that's you know, reasonable and they'll, they'll buy it anywhere. They don't care where it is right, um, in the world. And that's, that's clear from Tiger's behavior. It's clear from, from KOTU's behavior. It's clear from all these large investors' behavior. Um, so those are kind of the two ends of the spectrum, right? I'd say that the part where that gets tricky is that middle part, <laughs> right? It's that whole thing in between where like, okay, you've raised a little bit of seed funding and then how do you, how do you get yourself, you know, sort of from that, you know, um, you know, million or sub million dollars, I'm talking US dollars, of course, um, of, of revenue up to sort of that 10-ish range where all of a sudden everybody you know, wants to invest. And it's that, that middle range, I think, where, where, where a lot of the interesting stuff happens. You know, that's where we, we end up focusing a lot of our time. Um, it's, in some sense, it's the hardest time, right? Because you've shown that you can do something, that you can build some sort of business. But now the question is, can you build something really big, one? And two, can you attract the appropriate capital to help finance that next level of growth? Um, and so, it, and it's also in that middle stage, you know, where, um, you know, where the acquisitions happen typically, right? It's like, um, where a lot of the, a lot of those sort of intermediate exits happen sort of in that phase. Um, and that's where the depth uh, of the, um, sort of American system for, for M and A, as well as the American system for being able to aggressively finance those middle stage rounds, um, has been historically really good. I think there's definitely more of it happening in Europe, but really from a founder's point of view, what you're looking for in that middle stage is less the capital. It's less about like, you know, whether it's American capital or European capital, but it's more like who can help me, right? Like for my next stage, right? Like, do I need to get more of this type of customer? Are those types of customers in Europe or are they in the US? Who can help me do it? For this next stage, do I need to get better at, you know, I don't know, growth marketing, design, who are, where are the folks for the, that can help me do that? Are they, you know, here or there or wherever, you know? Um, and, um, and sort of, it, it becomes much more tactical, I think, um, in, that, in that middle stage. It's not just a pure capital markets thing. I think that the pure capital markets thing shows itself at the earliest and the latest stage. And in the middle, it becomes not so much a pure capital markets thing. It becomes much more this mix of like operational help, you know, can the investor add strategic value as well as the capital and everything in between? Yeah, so so interesting perspectives. And I guess, um, Saranga, maybe I can ask you to pick up on a point Rita's, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, pointed out, which was that, you know, uh, regardless, really, the exit market, you know, to paraphrase what I think Rita's was pointing out was the exit market is largely in the US. So. Mm -hmm. um, so ultimately, still, there's a big pull at some point to um, uh, to find uh, the connections in in the U.S. And so, is that do you see that changing, or is that is that still something that you're expecting to stay for for uh, uh, for a while? It, I I think it's going to change. Um, I think it it's slow, but it will change. So we've actually had two uh, European IPOs in the last four, five months, both of which are multi-billion dollar outcomes. Um, 
dark trace in the Huck Group. And so, um, and they're both in the UK other than the stock exchange. Um, and and actually, um, it's interesting because we were looking at the coverage of of them and the analyst reports and so on. And you know, as someone who took, I mean, I took my company public, which is also a technology company uh, in, in on the UK markets. And when I took my company public, it was it was tough. There was a very limited number of analysts and banks and sort of buy side investors who really understood tech. And and we had to work quite hard to find a small but but dedicated group who you know had the time and the sort of knowledge to really understand what we did, why it was valuable, give us the right multiple, you know, do do nice things to our share price when we were doing well, but also punish us when we weren't doing well, which is which is fine, but do it for the rational reasons rather than through lack of understanding. Um, I think that's become dramatically easier in the last few years um, because more and more of the global banks have good tech teams in Europe. Uh, more and more of the investors in Europe are interested in tech. We see a number of public market investors in Europe who are beginning to do sort of crossover private investing. Obviously, it's on a on a fraction of the scale as you see in New York and California, but it's still happening a lot more than it was. And so, I think actually, even exit markets, when it comes to kind of independent exits, will 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 become increasingly interesting in Europe. Um, Having said that, I think when it comes to M&A, particularly that mid-level M&A, which is what Jonathan was talking about earlier, that I think will be pretty US centric for a long time. And that's just because of where the big buyers are, right? At the end of the day, you know, um, if you look at the companies that could spend between $200 million and a billion dollars or maybe one and a half billion dollars on a company that's a combination of tech and a bit of revenue and a bit of an aqua hire, you know, that kind of uh, stage of exit, um, you know, all the big buyers there, apart from you know a couple of real exceptions, are, are in are in the US, and 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 of course those companies do buy in Europe as well. And we've we've sold a bunch of companies to you know Microsoft and to Twitter and to Facebook and to Google here in Europe. But most of that activity is still going to be in the US for a variety of reasons. So so I think the big exits actually you can do in Europe more and more, and I and I hope we'll see more of them. Um, for what it's worth, I know that a number of European governments are very are very keen to become recipients of that kind of business, right? They feel as though they, 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 they birth some of these companies and then they end up going to the US markets and they sort of lose that, that stage of the game and that, that stage of the value creation. So they, 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 there's a lot of incentive to create an ecosystem where that can happen here. And like I say, we've had two really good exits in, in those markets now and, and we feel a lot more open to that idea than I think we probably did five years ago as a firm. Um, but um, but especially in that middle stage, which is still really important um, because it's where a lot of recycling of capital happens, a lot of recycling of talent and so on, that's still very US centric. Um, so that's that's certainly what I see on the ground right now. OK, if, and, if I, and so go on. Yeah, go on. Yeah, just wanted to add a little bit to that, Andres. Uh, I, I think Saranga really hit the, the nail in its head there, um, you know, for the really exceptional companies that reach a lot of scale and are profitable or they're about like you know there's a particular type of company where you can reasonably expect to have a reasonably or even very successful you know public flotation uh in europe so that i think you know is is certainly what we've seen everything in the middle is is is, is still you know very tricky and you know from the venture firm's perspective that means you know inevitably the company you know, has to have like links with the U.S. Uh, right, uh, ideally from you know from early on. Now, I will say though that that if if we were to look you know back like five ten years time, like I don't know if you'd agree, but like you know the the HUD Group, um, you know Dark Trace, like you know Deliveroo, you know those sorts of IPOs. I mean, it, they, it would have been even hard, like much harder, like ten years ago, like those sorts of you know, especially some than others. But but just this broad statement, like it would have been just a lot harder to try and float them in Europe. So I think we're making progress and you sort of have to make progress, you know, from the tip of the iceberg a little bit, right? Um, and then you sort of hopefully, you know, go from there. Now, uh, am I positive that, you know, this is just going to trickle down and, you know, very soon we'll be able to see like, you know, the full suite of exit outcomes and, you know, flotation opportunities in Europe? No, but we're making progress and hopefully, you know, it's going, it's going to, to continue and we're going to see, you know, more opportunities. Uh, you know, for companies to uh, particularly to float, uh, because th that's really like something that Europe can do something about. It's hard, it's quite structural, it's the type of investor, it's the type of expectation, right? But it's at least something that Europe can do something about over time. If you're talking about M&A buyers, uh, I mean, it's just really hard to do anything about it. Like they are where they are yeah. and the activity mm -hmm. is closer to home uh, just by definition. So, 
you know, those sort of, you know, 100 to a billion or 100 to, you know, one and a half billion, like as Ranga said, like we're, you know, it's not all about, oh, like, you know, this 10 times revenue and that's what we're buying. Like oftentimes those acquisitions are not about that. And that in Europe will remain a challenge, you know, in the venture community. So um, that's, that, that's just sort of the, I think the lay of the land. But yeah, hopefully even in those sort of, you know, in those sort of segments, we will see opportunities emerge, you know, for companies to potentially, you know, float, uh, for example, which would be, which would be an exciting development. Yeah, great. And, and if you, if you think about um, founders, you know, starting their businesses or fairly early on in the businesses, you know, is it more important for some of them to think about going to the US, you know, really early, so accelerate a stage or even just saying, screw it, let's just, I was one of us, at least one founder needs to just move to the US and make it happen very early on. Is there a particular sort of type of company or sector or something else where you would particularly say that is like uh, important to think about right up front? I mean, I definitely don't think so. I, you know, I primarily am looking, you know, I, I know that when we look at companies, a lot of what we're looking for is like, you have a good argument that you can get to a lot of scale on it without spending a lot of money. <laughs> That's kind of, you know, the, the you know, it's at some level what venture capitalists are trying to do. Um, and, you know, I'd say that there's a lot of shorthand that, that American investors use in their head, sort of just mental rules of thumb um, to say, oh, this market is big in the US, this is fine. And, and capturing it is relatively you know, it's a well-known thing to get traction in some of these markets because it's been done. And there are some structural structural challenges in, 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 in Europe that make it possibly more challenging, but there's also like, it's clear that it's possible, right? Um, I think that's that's really where it, where it comes from is really, you know, expressing that vision, a clear, not even a vision, it's a, it's a level of detail more specific than a vision. It's like, a, show, me, show me the tactical ways by which you can sort of, you know, in those early days and that seed sort of series A stage, how you can like scale this thing by another factor of roughly 10 to 20, you know, um, so that you can get to that place where, you know, you're of meaningful size that you can that you can address all these other things. But for that for that first chunk, you can get that anywhere. And I think that's becoming more and more clear today. You know, sort of we went through, you know, there was sort of an era of technology where everything is sort of these these one size fits all platforms, right? Uh, I mean, this is this is becoming really clear in like e-commerce, right? Where Shopify, where in some sense it was first sort of like Amazon, sell on Amazon. And then Shopify is like, well, you know, if you're a merchant, maybe you want something a bit more specific. So here's a set of things Shopify creates, right? Uh, but now you're kind of seeing the next layer of that, which is like, okay, well, if you want something really specific to this market, maybe there are specific things you want. Maybe there are specific tools that are specific to your, your vertical or your audience. And there's sort of this like, deepening layer of specificity, more more vertical um, applications. And when you have those vertical applications, a lot of it just comes down to like, you know, can you execute go to market in a way that makes sense in your vertical? Um, and vertical might be like a sector vertical, but it might also be a geographic thing, right? I mean, like, you know, I think that it's definitely possible for, for there to exist, you know, sort of you know, many versions of, of some of these companies that, that have, you know, that are quite large with hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue that are actually geographically somewhat distinct. Now, part of the value that, um, you know, when investors invest in them, part of what that those big multiples imply is that investors believe that you'll be able to go international, even if you haven't yet. <laughs> so I think it's important to tell the story, but there's also this reality of like, okay, if you can, if you can just generate, you know, a scale, significant scale and significant revenue, investors at some level are like kind of okay with that, right? As long as it's like distributed in a reasonable way, it's it's like good revenue. It doesn't have to be actually truly international revenue, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I, I, I think that you could be quite, to put it very simply, if you're, if you're a founder thinking about this, there are three things you need, right? You need customers, you need talent, and you need capital. Those three things are kind of the key ingredients of any company. Um, and, and so the question you have to ask yourself at every stage is for what I need in the next year or two on these three axes, do I need to go somewhere else? Or do I have enough of that right here? Mm -hmm. And if you have it right here, 100% Jonathan's point, like why spend the money to go over somewhere else, right? That's always gonna be more expensive and more complicated. Um, and, and sometimes you absolutely do need to move to get one of those three things. And sometimes you don't. I think, um, you know, 
you, you literally have to do a sort of you know, three by three matrix to sort of answer all the possible permutations of that. But but just to give some sort of main you know, broad brushstroke examples, I think that a lot of consumer companies actually don't need to leave to have customers, right? I mean, actually, Europe is a huge place, has a really interesting market, operates in a very different way from the US. Some business models just work better here. We've seen that in a number of, in a number of kind of consumer operational type businesses. Um, but then if you think about talent and if you're, let's say, an enterprise software company, there's certain kinds of talent that you need at certain stages of that journey, which I would say is still way denser in, in the US and particularly in the Bay Area, actually. So if you want really, really like the world's best product people uh, on the enterprise software side, the world's best um, you know, VPs of sales or VP of marketing, those people tend to be in the Bay Area. And so if you need those people, you're probably going to have to end up there at some point, um, at least to hire those people, if nothing else. I think the bit that's become a lot more democratized is, is capital. So, so in the old days, there was definitely this sense of if you were a European entrepreneur, at some point you put your rucksack on, you got on a plane, you flew to Sun Hill Road to go find money. And actually, you don't need to do that now for two reasons, right? One is that there's more money right here. So, you know, um, you know, people like myself and Rita's can write that check right here and we can write from quite small ones to quite big ones. But also actually people like Jonathan are much more likely to, 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 to write that check, even though they're sitting in, in, in California at the moment, right? So I think that, that both the, the, the fact that the US investors are much happier with investing in Europe and the fact that there are more, more better, larger investors here already in Europe, that, that one has become less of an issue. But I think the customer and the talent thing will still always be a question for every company at every stage. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great matrix. And Ritis, maybe uh, there was uh, just another announcement recently about uh, Vinted's new funding rounds. You know, they don't they don't have a market in the U.S. to my knowledge, at least. Um, really, they're Europe based. Um, only capital from the U.S. Sort of any comments on that and sort of context. Yeah, sure, exactly. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a great example from the Baltics, right? Vinted, um, yeah, Vinted is, a, is the first uh, unicorn to come out of Lithuania, right? The first and only so far, at least officially, um, you know, uh, myself personally, but also like all of us at Lightspeed, and you know, we've been very excited and proud to lead the prior round, which basically put that unicorn status, you know, on the company. And uh, today they announced the raise, um, uh, you know, at, uh, at the three and a half billion um, you know, pre-money valuation. Uh, a lot of the capital that supported the company along the way has been has been you know from the U.S. Uh, that's true. There's also been a significant amount of European capital, including, in fact, this funding round, which was led by uh, you know EQT Growth, which is uh, you know a Swedish uh, Swedish fund uh, you know with significant operations now in uh, you know in, in in London as well. So um, it's one of those companies where it has uh, uh, pretty much all of its clientele in Europe. It's got uh, all of its talent in Europe and it's got a good chunk up to recently, the majority now, I don't know, we need to look at the cap table, but up to recently, the majority of capital from the US because objectively it was the best company, it was, it is the best company in the category um, that is very large. Uh, and while it is local, it is also locally very large as well. So you can take every country and you just understand just how deep each market is. And, and, and once, once that becomes understood, then there's no reason why, you know, large funds that seek for very high, you know, outcome, you know, opportunities uh, in terms of, you know, the company's value down the road uh, wouldn't get excited. So that's why we got excited at Lightspeed and, you know, uh, other funds before us, uh, you know, Insight and Excel, you know, got excited um, and uh, funds after us as well. Uh, so we could take growth, you know, this time around. So, um, yeah, you know, it's exciting and hopefully there's going to be you know, more companies reaching those sorts of levels, you know, from, you know, from the Baltics, uh, as well as, uh, as well as, as well as the rest of Europe. Yeah, it's a fantastic story for, for, for the Baltics, for sure. Um, so last question, and uh, I'll ask you to make it quick, because we're uh, going to run out of time soon. So, you know, is there a particular set of circumstances, if you're the CEO, that you, like, have to move? Like, uh, how do you think about the, the reason to move? I mean, uh, Saranga had a sort of a framework for thinking about that, particularly, but particularly related to the CEO. Like, where does this, when does a CEO need to move? Sort of what's the what's the main driver? Maybe so. It's very much along the lines of what Saranga was saying before. I would say if you're the CEO of an early stage company, and of those three things, maybe I'll just focus on on, on customers for now. If you 
as an early stage CEO, you have to find customers. That's your job. Find, close, work with them, expand, do it again, like until it becomes a little bit of a repeat motion. And so before you can repeat, you really have to figure it out. So if your customers are likely not going to be in Europe, uh, then you'll have to move. Uh, and in fact, we've seen this yeah. so many times in Israel, for instance, right, where we have been operating successfully for 15 plus years. Um, they just have that in their DNA, like they, they start the company and, and many of them are enterprise software companies, you know, cybersecurity, you know, companies and areas like that, you know, they, you know, they, they, they take the first capital with one hand and, you know, the plane ticket is already in the other hand and it doesn't matter almost who funded it, you know, off they go, you know, hunting for customers. So, you know, but it's very much along the lines of what Saranga was, um, you know, was, was saying, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And final no, comments, agree with that. Customers. I think I definitely agree with that on customers. I think one other thing that I, that I think we didn't we didn't really touch on, which I do think is is interesting, um, something we've seen um, in Europe is really um, sort of the efficiency of of talent, right? Like you don't have to pay as much. <laughs> it's very simple, right? Like a software engineer who worked at Google in San Francisco, you're going to paying like absurd amounts of money to get them to build some software, <laughs> frankly, right? Um, and you know, being able to do that for less in Europe is a big piece of it. Um, I think it's important to think about things like that because you know, there's also this capital cycle component of it, right? Um, you know, things are things are obviously very good right now because, uh, you know, because of a, a variety of reasons, but, it, you know, when, if and when there is a pullback, the pullback will be felt in that middle stage, right? The, the company that's burning like $800,000 a year, or $500,000, $400,000 a year, and is not quite at scale yet, is gonna have a hard time financing that intermediate round, right? Um, when they're in Europe, the ones that are kind of marginal. And so, you know, for the founders, I would say, you know, just remember to be lean <laughs> and like take advantage of the fact that your labor is cheaper. And like, that is that is a massive, massive advantage, right? Um, even, even with American yeah. companies nowadays, it's, it's frankly rare for me to see a company that's 100% in the Bay Area. It's extremely rare now, nobody does it. Um, you know, people are like, okay, a couple people in, in San Francisco and then folks either in Eastern Europe or in Vietnam or in India, something, right? And that's 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 yeah. a big piece of it. And and I expect that as that trend continues, Europe will continue to be, you know, sort of at the, at the forefront of taking advantage of those trends. Yeah, I think so. So uh, I, we're out of time, unfortunately, but uh, uh, delighted to have you guys on. Really appreciate you spending the time helping uh, the founders from the Baltics get a leg up and get a better understanding of how they should think about building their businesses. So uh, thank you very much and uh, talk to you hopefully all soon. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Thanks for hosting. Bye. Bye.